and then uh, through that last week and into Easter, uh, which we celebrated last Sunday. And, but it would seem like uh, we would miss a great opportunity if we just went from the resurrection back to the early times of the, the Gospels when the disciples are still hiding. <laughs> I think we need to free them. We need to let them out. And so that's what we're going to look at today. They felt at risk. Have you ever felt at risk? When I was thinking about this, I realized, you know, I feel at risk every Sunday standing up here. <laughs> and I feel at risk the night before. And when I come here and I'm wondering, you know, is what I've put together going to be up to snuff? Did I choose the right version of maybe three uh, different attempts? And so um, being at risk is definitely how the disciples felt. And uh, before I go any further, let's pray. Let's pray, Lord, we do. We just pray that uh, you would help us to recognize where we might be feeling at risk, where we might be afraid, and Lord, let your words comfort us too. Lord, in all the uncertainty and uh, trials that we go through, we just ask God for your special touch and that it would come to us even yet today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the fact that the disciples are not yet grasping the resurrection. They're hidden away. They're not out there waiting for Jesus to appear. They're feeling at risk, and so they're hiding. Another thing we're going to look at is Jesus' first words are peace to you. In the midst of the feelings of risk and fear. And the next thing we'll look at is that Thomas, it's in all part of this next segment uh, in, in John chapter 20, if you want to go there in your own Bibles. Uh, Thomas, I think, is given a bad rap. Now, he's not referred to as doubting Thomas in the Bible. It's something that he's picked up, and we can see why. But I think he's getting a bad rap, and I want to take a little bit of a look at that. And then uh, at the closing, we'll have, have some review with some questions that you can uh, ponder. So let's pick up with the disciples, um, some, if not most of whom, have been hiding all weekend and read it through once from John 20, 19 through 29. It begins like this, verse 19, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, after he said this, he showed them his hands and said, uh, and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed. I'm missing something. He said, again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, it takes a little bit of a turn here, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So we're going to take a closer look at this. Going back to the uh, verse 19 where it says, on the evening of that first day of the week. 
the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Well, let's take a look at that. Uh, first day of the week means it was Sunday evening because it said was, says it was the evening of that first day. Uh, this room, it was perhaps a familiar place where they had met together with Jesus many times. Maybe it was even the place, that upper room, where they would celebrate or where Pentecost would uh, uh, occur. We don't know. Or maybe, rather than choosing a familiar place, maybe they preferred to have a place where they were less known to be. For fear of the Jewish leaders, remember? They were hiding. So anything's a possibility there. Well, that got me to think and imagine what we might call Gestapo Church. Their church, if you will, the, the Jewish religion had, was, their fear was that Gestapo church would come and arrest them, accost them, crucify them, treat them the way they did with Jesus. Can you imagine such a thing? Well, I did imagine such a thing. And I thought of in the Muslim religious regions, we have ISIS and we have Al-Qaeda and we have the Taliban and many others where terrorism exists under the auspices of worshiping God. Now there's a difference between uh, Muslims as a religion and Muslimism, or Islam and Islamism, where it becomes its own national identity and is intolerant of anyone that doesn't comply. Someone told me once that religious fundamentalism is dangerous wherever it exists, and I think that's true. America has had its own dark history during the Puritan days in England when people were burned as witches. We'd like to think we're too sophisticated uh, for that to ever happen again. We're more inclined to fear persecution on the secular front, but it could well be from other so-called Christians. One way or another, I suspect we need to be on guard when we see signs of the reason the founders called for separation of church and state. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it, it makes me think. When we think of Gestapo, of religious Gestapo, um, uh, they had a, uh, our founding fathers had a, their experience in Europe that was oppressive, where we religious d domination and fighting between the, uh, the Protestant and the Catholic Church had uh, created great problems. Then the Puritans came over here, and, and the founding fathers realized they mustn't let that influence the political realm and be imposed upon all people under the auspices of Christianity. That's how I see it. Well, we're going to continue. Verse 9, where John says, It was evening of that first day of the week, Sunday evening, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. I'm going to press pause here. Remember, they had seen a detachment of soldiers come into the Garden of Gethsemane and take Jesus away. It was, it was Pharisees. It was, uh, there was this um, deta attachment detachment of soldiers and Pharisees, they came for Jesus carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. So naturally, these, men, these disciples would have been afraid. John 18.10 goes on to say that Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now, tradition says that Jesus put it back on, but I haven't found that. And maybe you know where it is, and you can point it out. Now, Mark 14.50, remember, from the perspective of the, of the harmony of the Gospels, we get a fuller picture as different people contribute. Mark 14.50 says that they, the disciples, all forsook him, Jesus, and fled. So when this detachment of soldiers comes and the Pharisees and they arrest Jesus, they've got clubs and torches and all these things, the disciples fled says they all forsook him. So along with the crucifixion that would occur shortly afterward, there was a fear that 
hit them and they lock themselves away. That's what we're looking at today. Now, doesn't it seem a little strange to you when you read John's account that Peter and John go right into the courtyard. Peter, who's just cut the ear off of the servant's priest, they go into the, high, the courtyard of the high priest outside of his home, and it says that John even went inside. Well, I just have to understand things like this. And so I looked it up, and um, in Acts we find out that this, that a John is named who was part of the priest's family. So there may have been, and that, and that uh, he was a familiar person to them. Maybe that's why this John could enter into where Jesus is being interrogated. It seems just strange to me that he could do that if there wasn't some kind of inside track. It also seems that they were very bold to go right there when it says all, Mark says, all the disciples fled. We see these guys are there. I don't look at these as contradictions. I look at them as a fuller picture of what was going on. We also see John present at the crucifixion with Mary, the mother of Jesus. So although Mark says that they all fled, wouldn't you expect that they would have been um, in the crowd as Jesus is being paraded through the streets carrying his cross on which he would hang? Wouldn't you imagine that they might have been watching from a distance? as to see how all of this was going to play out. The Bible doesn't say it, but when we put ourselves in the picture, it seems to me that I would have wanted to do that. I would have wanted to be able to see what's going on. As we return the, to the text, it says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, I think in previous messages where we're looking at the Beatitudes, I've said that Jesus embodies all of the characteristics that we see in the Beatitudes. He teaches on them, and that's the way he lives. One of those that he promises is, blessed are the peacemakers. So we see continuity with the very first words out of his mouth to a room full of very frightened disciples when he says, peace be with you. Well, what else should we expect from the resurrected Prince of Peace? The one who told them while he was still with them, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. He promises peace. Now, if he was like us, when he comes back into the room with the disciples, we might or they might expect him to come and shame or reprimand them. Don't you think he'd have had plenty of good, justifiable reason to say, you guys, you are so pathetic. We've spent this much time together. In my hour of need, while I'm praying in the garden, you fall asleep. When the, uh, when the officials come, you run away. Peter, you denied me three times. What kind of Friends are you? I called you my friends. They might have expected that kind of thing. It certainly would have been deserved, wouldn't it? Or they could have expected that he would just never again show them his face. Just be done with them. I think we would probably do well to call them the doubting disciples. And not just lay that whole thing on on Thomas. I think we could call them the doubting disciples and we could find ourselves in that same crowd with them. So when I say Jesus embodies all the Beatitudes, I'm talking about his daily interaction with people, how he interacts with people. He's about blessing people. Jesus is about blessing people who follow his ways. And it's not just lip service. He walks the talk. He both speaks the words, he tells them, and he models the way to receive blessings. And here he extends the blessed assurance of peace. That's what we see him doing here with these frightened followers. Verse 20, after he said, peace be with you, he showed them his hands and sighed. And John says the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. 
I don't know if some of them went up there and tested those wounds to see for themselves. There were a bunch of them there. In fact, uh, there's indication that it was more than just the 10, but it was a, a large number of followers you find in one of the Gospels. And all it took was for him to be among them and speak four little words of reinsurance, peace be with you, and their whole demeanor was changed. One minute they, locked, they were locked away feeling fearful of the Jewish authorities and at risk, and the next minute it says they were overjoyed. We, wonder, we might wonder, okay, well, how did Jesus get in there? Why didn't they hear him picking the lock? If he was going to come in just like a, 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 any ordinary person. Or did he get beamed in like you see on Star Trek and materialize right there in front of him? We don't know how he did this, but what we, what we do know is that we have a supernatural God. And when Someone said once that when his super meets our natural, amazing things happen. Well, he's a supernatural God. We see that again and again in the Bible. Wouldn't you like to be part of something like that that's happening? I, we got to allow it. We'd probably be somewhat fearful. Because it's outside of the realm of where we operate. Especially when it's something like this. You're hiding away and all of a sudden there's Jesus <laughs> in the middle of the room. And the door didn't open and the windows are closed. And somehow or other he just appears there with you. Kind of like when we hear of an angel appearing, people are frightened. Jesus says in verse 21, he repeats it again. He says, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Hear this. If you're a disciple of Christ, he's saying, as just as the Father has sent me to minister to you, I am sending you to minister to others. And then he says, if you forgive any, while well, he says, receive the Holy Spirit, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on to say, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Well, I want to pull this apart a little bit because it's easily confusing. Receive the Holy Spirit. It certainly raises questions, and I feel obligated to not just pass over something as, as big as that. So, I want to give you a short explanation that I found from a professor, Craig L. Blomberg, who asks and answers this question in the Apologetic Study Bibles, notes by Holman Bible Publishers. Blomberg says this, he asks the question, is this John's massively reworked counterpart to Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? And he answers it, he says, no. Only 10 of the disciples were present and nothing spiritual happened afterward. They simply went fishing. You find that in chapter 21, verse 3. So, unlike at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit didn't immediately do a big transformation. He continues by saying his explanation or reconciliation of John's account with that of Luke. And here's the short version of how he does that. He says, more likely this was a dramatic object lesson or initial bestowal of the Spirit to prepare them for the more dramatic filling that would happen seven weeks later in Jerusalem. You can find, probably find a dozen alternate explanations for this, and maybe you've, got, maybe you've worked this out for yourself and have your own explanation of what did it, what did it mean when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, and yet know that it would be at Pentecost that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. Well, one thing that's different is it was poured out on all people at that time. It was poured out available to all people and it fulfilled what the prophet Joel had prophesied. How about this next part? As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This sounds like a preview, once again, of the Great Commission. 
Jesus will give them that in Matthew 28, just before he ascends. And that's where he also tells them, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the gift my Father is giving of the Holy Spirit. A more dramatic filling. If you're a disciple of Jesus, then he has called you to send you or at least send some of your resources, some of your money that he has entrusted to you to people who are on the front lines. It's one way of sending us on behalf of uh, supporting others to fulfill the Great Commission. We don't just sit it out and call ourselves disciples who are obedient to Christ. Last week, I spoke with our Cuban pastors by WhatsApp. They asked me to thank you so much for your support. They're multiplying what's been given for the phone cards that we called it the Pay It Forward campaign, those digital phone cards that make it possible in a country where there are so few services for pastors to have a way to communicate with their congregations. He, and, and what they do is one phone card at $25 a month, plus or minus, has uh, promotional offers that allows them to spread it out to at least three pastors. And so they currently are covering 100 pastors with these very, very important phone cards. Uh, we also, as a church, direct uh, dollars that you've given to their benevolence fund, which is used for uh, very carefully identified long-term projects and they have to have a budget to know that they can make that kind of a commitment that they'll be able to see through all the way. And this is in addition to the phone cards has provided internet service to 30 pastors. And some of these people don't even have vehicles to travel with so whatever they can do to reach their congregations uh, by whatever technology uh, is, is, can be purchase for them is very valuable. Now, one particular long-term project that they're quite proud of um, is that their church in Remedios uh, has the means to produce video, uh, um, uh, kind of the equivalent of VBS for children. And those who have internet now can bring that into their churches. And for those who don't, they can make a flash drive copy of it and get that to them where they can take it to the next step. But they're making, they're, they're, they've impacted over a hundred children in this way. So this is just one of the ways that your support helps us obey the words of, of Jesus. Uh, and of note, uh, last week we sent $2,000 of $3,000 that we committed to long-term projects for them. And that's money that was being set aside for Ted and I to return there. But since we're not, there's no reason for us to hold money that they need now that can serve them in our absence. This is just one of the ways your support helps us obey Jesus' words. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Another profound thing he says in this passage is this. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. In my mind, that means that you hold unforgiveness in your heart. That's, or if you let that go, you are free from your own unforgiveness. But another commentary offers some additional insight. After telling the disciples to receive the Holy Spirit, which would happen more fully at Pentecost, in Acts 2, Jesus sends the disciples to continue his ministry and to preach the gospel. Those that hear of Jesus through these preachers, through these disciples who are preaching the gospel, either directly or indirectly, will have the opportunity to repent of their sins and receive God's forgiveness. Another, uh, another paragraph here in this commentary says, the disciples themselves, this is important, this sorts some things out. The disciples themselves have no power to forgive sins apart from that given them by the message of the death of Christ for their redemption. It's the only way they can repent is that 
Christ forgives you. I'm here to tell you that you can be forgiven. It doesn't matter what it is. Christ forgives you. So once again, we see in his final words with the Great Commission, where disciples of Christ are told to go to baptize and make disciples, new disciples, they're to teach them everything. Let's, let's personalize it. We're to teach them everything that we've learned and put into practice. Anything short of teaching what we know but don't put into practice is what? What's that called? He, he, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Do as I say, not as I do. Well, Paul affirms this idea of putting into practice the words, and he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, speaking to the Corinthian church in a letter, he says, follow my example as I follow Christ. If you don't see me doing it, don't copy it. So the, here, the church is hereby commissioned to perpetuate these Christ-like characteristics not to be the weak link in the chain of Christianity, but to bestow his peace on all people, the very reason for which Jesus came. Now, the next section of this passage in, in my Bible is under a heading that says, Jesus appears to Thomas. It begins with verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers in uh, the, the holes um, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I, I can't believe. Well, I feel somewhat compelled to exonerate or at least sympathize with Thomas. Who wants to be known who wants to have the moniker of Doubting Bruce? Doubting, who sh how about you, Linda? How about Doubting Linda? You, you, would you want to be known as Doubting Linda? Doubting Janice? Doubting Frank? Doubting Kevin? No, I would not want to go down in history as that person. Yet many of us, including the disciples, have doubt. They doubted that he was actually going to resurrect, and that's why they were hiding away. So I want to sympathize with, with Thomas a bit. And I have to say this about guys, what I know about guys. We have a habit of pulling one another's leg, right? We like it when we can get someone to believe something bizarre that's just not true. Uh, the joke is on you in that way, and we think that's pretty funny. Well, they might have had that kind of banter going on between them in the, in the years that they traveled together, and Thomas might have thought, this is just one more time. You're trying to make me the brunt of the, go of the joke, and I'm not buying it. One more thing, all the other disciples had the opportunity to see Jesus appear and say, peace be with you and offer them the opportunity to test it for themselves. And as I said, maybe some of them even did it. I want to um, add something else, too. We might just as easily call our man Thomas, Thomas the Brave. And we can do that, we can do that from the way he responds when word comes to Jesus and the disciples that Lazarus is on his deathbed. And that Jesus should come right away and heal him. And it says, um, uh, I didn't write the, the reference down. Uh, I believe John writes it. It says, but Rabbi, they said, this being all of the disciples, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you. The Jews where you're going into the region of Judea where you'll be going, they tried to stone you. We don't want, why are you going back? This puts you at risk. It says then in verse 16, Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, 
that we may die with him. If Jesus is going to die, let's go. We're with him, heart and soul. So we could, we could call Thomas that we're familiar with referring to, just kind of rolls off the lips as the tongue as doubting Thomas. We could call him Thomas the Brave. When everybody else said, no, 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 he said, yes, let's go. Back to our text, verse 26, a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Well, it struck me that it says that they were in the house again. And so sometimes one translation says things a certain way and another says it another way. I checked to see, they all say again. Uh, what, did they leave? Did they go out to get ice? What happened? Where were they? Well, we know Thomas was absent from them at one point, and so maybe they need food, they need supplies. Maybe they slipped out after dark to get things because it says here that they were in the house again. What else does it say? Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Well, even though that's deja vu for the others, it's always nice to hear, isn't it? You, you can't say peace be with you too many times. It's not going to, I don't want to hear that anymore. So even though it's deja vu for the others, I think Jesus is saying it for Thomas's benefit this time. It's a gripping moment for Thomas, just like it was for them, and it probably is one more time for them. Jesus doesn't always tell them what's going to happen next. More times than not, they're just trying to catch up with what's happening in the moment. So I think his words, peace be with you, are especially for Thomas's benefit. Then he tells Thomas the same thing he told them. This says specifically, he said to Thomas, put your finger, your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Here's where that doubting part would come in. Someone must have capitalized on that. But how many times did Jesus have to shake his head, shake his head, take a deep, a, a deep breath, and address the lack of faith for the whole lot of them? You of little faith. That's doubt, isn't it? That's like, hey, you know, I, I don't see that happening. Well, I'd like to imagine that Thomas's remark of unbelief could be akin to, I want to believe, but I'm going to need some help with my unbelief just as we find in, in uh, Mark's gospel about a man who comes to Jesus with a, uh, a child that was probably demon-possessed or uh, was having seizures. Even though Jesus probably wasn't hanging out at the tomb when Mary Magdalene comes with the message that I've seen the Lord, Peter and John head straight for the tomb. Were they needing proof? And nobody else even bothered. So in terms of this doubting thing, I think we just want to back off a little bit and be careful because we're probably really convicting ourselves or it should be convicting to us. Well, how does Thomas respond to Jesus? He addresses the risen Jesus in the most personal way. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. We should know that, Tom, that John doesn't say that Thomas took Jesus up on his invitation to put his fingers in his hands or reach out and put his hand in his side. It doesn't say that he did that. It says, he said, Jesus, he said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. I think he, it, was, it just hit him. I, I could picture him falling to his knees in the humblest manner and saying, my Lord and my God, forgive me. Forgive my unbelief. Maybe we have the wrong Thomas assigned to doubting Thomas. Maybe we have this Thomas mixed up with Thomas Jefferson, a confirmed doubting Thomas. So much so that Jefferson took a knife and cut all the references to the supernatural out of his copy of the, the, of the Bible to become what is known as the Jeffersonian Bible. No room for su supernatural. That's beyond belief. 
So Jesus' final words here are for all of us. Then Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, here are some heartwarming things that we've seen about Jesus today and that I'll pose as questions. Don't you love how the Prince of Peace can miraculously get to where you are hiding to say, peace be unto you? Don't you love that? That when you know the Lord, he can come in where you're surrounded with doubt and despair and discouragement and say, peace, my peace I give you. Not that worldly kind of peace that's passing in an instant. My peace, my lasting peace, I bestow unto you. And isn't it nice that Jesus pronounces peace and not blame or shame when we deserve a reprimand? Isn't that a nice, we've, we've visited these things, I want to bring them back and remind you. And aren't you glad that as we see in his embodiment of the Beatitudes, that his desire is to be a source of blessing. And he sent his Holy Spirit in his place to help us be a blessing to others too. So I have three final questions, and these are for you to reflect upon and to talk to Jesus and maybe even someone else about. First question, do you and I, us, this is do we need a, do we need to see a miracle to believe? Or do you just want a miracle to help others you care about believe? Or maybe a bit of both? I'm inclined to think a bit of both would, would be a gracious answer for us we give ourselves a little bit of breathing room that I don't need to see a miracle to believe. I'm beyond that. I haven't, you know, maybe I'm seeing miracles all the time and I just don't recognize them for what they are. Maybe I just take too many things for granted. The fact that we can sit here in the midst of a COVID epidemic, pandemic, and we can still meet as a church. Second question, do you have doubts when others tell of miracles they've experienced? I have to admit, I do. I try to measure that person up and see if they have a, a, a history of, uh, of credibility or if I've heard all kinds of wacky stuff from them or if they come across strange, strange to me or if they're from Santa Cruz, <laughs> for instance. The third question, is a different kind of question. In regards to fears, it has to do with fears. Does unbelief in the divine, supernatural, loving power that we attribute to an invisible God have you hiding behind locked doors? Isolating from him? Not trusting? Not believing he can take you through the fire? through the water and deliver you to the other side? Are you hiding back there with other doubters behind locked doors feeling at risk? Is, that, is it being reinforced by other people who are uh, doubting? And then the, the last part of that question is for you, for your reflection. What are some of those fears that keep you isolated from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, here's where we've gotten to. We're here at a point where, with those questions and with this summary, I'm just going to pray that you've taken something in today. And so, Lord, I pray that your people were here, that this is, a, this is an appropriate way for us to move beyond uh, Jesus' resurrection and celebrating that, but only a couple of women knowing about it, and Peter and John recognizing, the, seeing the evidence. Uh, but other disciples still locked away in hiding, feeling at risk, fearful. Lord, we would want to apply that to ourselves in any areas that you want to show us today. Today, this next week, in our lives going forward, Lord, remind us 
that we don't want to be known by the moniker of Doubting Kevin or Doubting Add Your Name right here. We don't want to be known that way. We want to be known as brave, as believers, as trustworthy and reliable uh, perpetuators of the good news of the kingdom that Jesus came and has commissioned us to do. Lord, we want to be known as the people that are helping uh, folks like our Cuban brothers to do effective ministry with so little and have the passion in the midst of their troubles uh, to make a difference. And so God, I ask the blessing, knowing that you've given it and knowing that it's more a matter of us recognizing and receiving it than doubting it. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, we'll receive the offering. Did I do that already? You know, a lot of times I forget to do it at all. This time I want to... <laughs> <laughs> you know, in case you felt like you wanted to, uh, you know, throw something towards Cuba. You know, one of the things they told me, one of the things they told me, and, and we can expect some radical inf uh, inflation also, pork, which is, a, is a, a staple of their diet, has gone up, multiplied times three, which makes it really hard already in difficult situations to where the word starvation is being used in these poverty-stricken places. So, um, how about this? How about we have a closing song? That'd be a good place for that, wouldn't it? <laughs>